all these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered good morning happy father's day to everybody out there who has children who've invested their lives in growing them and loving them and um it's funny because, like, you know, we look at days like this on Father's Day, and, you know, as, as a guy, I'm like, ah, oh, it's not that big a deal, right? You know, I mean, it's whatever. But it really does make a difference when we can stop to really honor the things that a father does in the lives of his children. And so uh, I want to open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll dive into our, our message. Lord Jesus, thank you that you all are our great father that our lives are submitted to you, Lord, and we know that you are protecting us. We know that you are loving us, that you are directing us. And Jesus, that love never changes. The love you give to us, Lord, is unconditional. So God, I pray that I and the rest of the men who are fathers in this room would be a living example of what you're doing right now in our lives, each individually and collectively as a church body. May our children grow to know the sweetness of who you are through the image we bear every day through Christ Jesus our Lord. And all God's children said, amen. I want you guys to open up to Genesis chapter 15. And I titled this message, Good Father. And as I was looking through this message, I started looking through Father's Day cards. And I read a Father's Day card, and the card said this. It says, what is a father? A father is someone who wants to catch you before you fall, but instead picks you up and brushes you off and lets you try again. A father is someone who wants to keep you from making mistakes, but instead lets you find your own way. Even though his heart breaks in silence each time you get hurt. A father is someone who holds you when you cry, corrects you when you break the rules, shines with pride when you succeed, and has faith in you even when you fail. That's a father. And it, was, and, and it resonated with me because that's exactly what it was like with my dad growing up. It was powerful and amazing and had this figure that I could look up to. And I, as I was younger, I thought my dad could do no wrong. Sorry, Dad, you probably made some mistakes, right? <laughs> yeah, just a few. But every time I had some hard circumstance in my life, I would have my dad there to help me. But the one thing I remember tremendously over and over again is my, my dad would give me this amazing promise. You know what that promise was? I'm here for you, son. That is one of the most amazing things that a father can tell their children is that I am here for you. I'm here for you. And one of the best things that a child can hear is that my father is going to act on my behalf because it allows us to not focus on all the details, but it allows us to feel comfort knowing what's gonna happen when they step in. And I want you to hear that because so many times we get so lost in the details, it's really what the big picture is that we need to look at and focus upon. And today, today we're going to look at a Father's Day story with our friend Abram, the father of faith. And God is going to tell him, hey, Abram, I'm going to step in. I'm going to take care of business. Because that's exactly what our good father does, our heavenly father does. When his children, they need comforting, when they need encouragement, he gives promises. And those promises that we can cling to every single day to help us succeed, to help us be the men that we need to be as fathers. So I want you to open up. Genesis chapter 15, and we're gonna start in verse one. And I, and I love this because the first thing it says, it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. So just when we stop and think about what is God doing right now? The one thing God, 
a good father does is he tells his children that they're safe, that they're protected, that they're taken care of. But the question you ask is, why is Abram fearful in this moment? I mean, the Bible says that fear of man brings a snare. And let's be honest here. That really gets caught up in our lives, does it not? I mean, if you're a dad, you might go, man, am I blowing it right now? But Abram just had a victorious battle. And he fought and he won against a coalition of four powerful kings. But what happened? He started playing the what if game, right? He's thinking perhaps this King Elam is going to decide to retaliate like he did with those other kings that didn't pay homage to him. And what if he comes back? Look, man, I only have 318 guys that I, I can't stand up against another army. I know the Lord was with me, he could say, and I know that I was victorious, but what if? What if next time it's not so victorious? What if? And as we've seen before, and it seems so often in Abraham's life, and even in ours, when we start having some triumphs, when we start having some victories, what happens? A trial. A trial comes around. And how do we know? Because the first thing that God tells his child is, don't fear. Do not fear. And you all should know something about fear. You probably all do. It's the most destructive emotion that can ever manifest itself in the life of a believer. And even in the life of a father. It can paralyze you. And sometimes it's irrational. It's not logic. It defines reason. And it sometimes controls our lives. And as we continue to live, there's a portion of our lives that we will feel this fear. But the reality is, is that that will never ever happen. And that's the reason why that fear is also an acronym for false evidence appearing real. Do you hear that? False evidence appearing real. There's some things that we will go through that we will fear, but we will never ever have that circumstance happen in us. And so for whatever reason, he's afraid and the Lord gives him his beautiful promise. He says, do not fear. It's a commandment. Don't do that at all. Don't fear. Why? I am your shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. So a good father tells his children he will protect them. And that because of it, they were going to benefit greatly. I mean, I want you to hear this. Every time I, I was distraught or I had a trial in my life, man, I found comfort in the arms of my father. That doesn't mean I was a mama's boy either. You know, I mean, I was always a mom. But, man, there was something about it. I, what I found myself is I wasn't crying as often in my dad's arms as I was in my mom's arms. <laughs> but even when the, our father is protecting us, does that mean we don't struggle? No, we still do. We still have doubts. And we see this in the next verse because there's another thing that is on Abraham's mind. And because fear starts to take in, it allows us to start playing the what-if game. Anybody ever done that before? Yeah, I think we all do. Anybody here conquered that what-if part? Because if I want you, if you have, we need a seminar put on by you. But the reality is, is that's not happening, okay? So let's see what he says. Abram, verse 2, it says, Abram said, Oh, Lord God, what will you give me since... I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to count them, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Abram's frustrated. He doesn't understand what's taking so long. And how is it possible that God is going to come through? You ever have those questions? God, I don't know how you're going to work through this. I got a lot of questions, Lord. But he still addresses God with respect, even though he knows 
things are not going his way. Even though he knows he still hasn't gotten the thing he wants. Because let's be honest, as children, man, we want it now, and we want to know everything about how we're going to get it. But a good father says, you're not ready for those things. You know, one thing my dad used to always say is, is God's delays are not God's denials. You hear that? God's delays are not God's denials. Sometimes God is telling you right now, just wait. I have a plan for you. And I mentioned that because there's times in our lives when we don't understand what God's doing. But we can understand that God is faithful. And just like Abram in the times of things that he's starting to question, we just need to just get it out. We just need to say, God, I don't understand. You don't have to keep it all bottled up inside. You don't have to keep it bottled up inside. God is your father, and a good father wants to hear his children ask questions. I want you to hear that because sometimes we go, I just got, I just got to make it all sense of right here. No. That is the one of the most powerful things that we have in the life of a Christian believer is we have access to God in prayer. We have access. Even though my dad might live, you know, two hours away, I have access to him limitedly. But the God of the universe who calls you his son or daughter, the father of everything, you have access to him 24 hours a day, anytime you call, anytime. And so Abram says, I hear you. But how are you going to do this, Lord? What will you give me seeing I am childless? See, what he's, he's concerned about is all the what ifs, but he's also concerned about, God, you, you made me this prob- promise, but I can't see the solution. Now, Lord, how are you going to do this? It's okay to ask why or how. And the reason why is because he's concerned, right? In those times, You know, whoever, if you didn't have a child, all of your wealth went to your most prominent servant, the most prominent person in your your household. And so he's saying, look, God, I don't know what's going on. And I know you've told me I'm going to have, you know, children. You're going to make me into a nation. How's that going to work? But God says, no, it's not going to be your servant. But God, I'm thinking about all the things like, I'm getting pretty old. I don't know if I can have children. See, we start looking at all of the details and what we think it can and can't happen. But with God, everything is possible. Everything is possible. Whatever you're going through right now, everything is possible in Jesus. And so, like a good father, the Lord takes Abraham outside. And even uses PowerPoint illustration to tell him something. He says, Abram, Abram, look outside. Look up into the heavens. Look out into the starry sky. What do you see? The vast amazingness of the universe. He says, you see all those stars? Abram, your descendants will be more innumerable than all of those. He shows them something and you know what? It just, it clicks. But I want you to hear this yourself. I suggest you do the same. I suggest you do the same. When you're feeling down and out and feeling forsaken by God and you haven't seen God's promises continue to move through in your life, just take a little drive in the night. Go up to the mountains. Get out of your car. Step up. Look at the sky and see everything that God put on display. And then I want you to just say, my father did that. The one who I'm putting my faith in did that. And sometimes it's about your uplook that determines your outlook. You hear that? Your uplook determines your outlook. And sometimes we're so here, we don't really experience the greatness of what's around us. So a good father takes the time to talk and to explain things to their children. And this is what Abraham's response was. I love it. It's powerful. It says, then 
he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is a powerful verse. Verse 6 is one of the most important verses in all of the Bible. He believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. Like Abram chose to believe God and just take him simply at his word. Just because he felt, my father is showing me something amazing. And you know what? I might not see what's going on. I might not know all the details, but I believe my daddy. And that's what he's saying. I believe him. And we see this over and over again in the Bible. Paul uses it as an example. James uses it as an example of how we are saved. It's a powerful thing. And we are saved just like Abram was saved, not by the law, not by our works, but by what the word of God says. We are saved by believing in the word of God. What does the word of God say about my sin? What does the word of God say about my condition? What do I need to do about that sin? What is the word say about me responding to sin? I need to respond to Jesus. It tells me what I need to do and that Jesus is the only way to the Father. And if I will do that just like Abram did, God reckons righteousness to me. And that word reckon means he just adds it to my account. It means at one point I was completely spiritually bankrupt, completely, and then I believed in the word of God. I said, Jesus, I ask for you to be my Lord and Savior. Why? Because I'm a sinner. And I know that you are the only one who can save me from my sin. And I believe that you came to this earth, you lived a sinless life, and that you went to a cross, you paid for my sin, and you were buried and rose three days later and rose victoriously. And now that you are in heaven, and because of that, because of what I believe, you make me rich. Not because I earned it, right? Because of grace. Because it's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's grace. You just did because you love me. Not because I earned it, not because of anything else, but because who you are and how you love me. And verse seven moves in and says, and he said to him, I am the Lord. And it's funny because we go, why is God reintroducing himself to Abram right now? Like kind of weird, right? But the reality is, is that God is saying, look, this is who I am. I am the Lord who brought you out of the or of the Chaldeans, to give you this land, to possess it. Promise. He said, O oh Lord God, how may I know I will possess it? Right? God's saying, I'm giving you a promise. And what does Abraham, Abram do? Okay, Lord, I don't see it. But then God says, so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. That's kind of a different menu, huh? Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Now I want to stop right here because this is the time where I want you to see what his concerns are and what God says, I'm going to go forward. This is how I'm doing it. And I want to stop because I want us to ask some questions in our tables. And I'm going to put them up in a second. But the, the one thing I want you to think about, the first question is this. What causes you most doubt in your walk with God? Because there's a lot of things that Abram here is like, man, I just, I just don't know how you're doing it, God. Because there's lots of things that we doubt in our walk, right? No? Yeah, I think there is, right? There's a lot of unknowns. God, I'm still kind of oh, struggling through this, or I don't know that. I need, I need to know more about your character, Lord. And then number two, it says, when we are especially vulnerable to doubt promises, when are we especially vulnerable to doubt promises God has made? When are we the most vulnerable? 
And the third thing is, when God promises something, do we only get them once we perform right? That's a question I want you to hear because a lot of us are putting stuff based upon performance. Right? So, I'm going to give us about 15 minutes or so, and uh, I'm going to put those up, and I want you to just be vulnerable. Ask the questions. Talk to everybody, you know? This is a time where you just realize, you know what? We don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. Joe has not all the answers. <laughs> and so the reality is, is that this is where the body of Christ comes together collectively and starts working through these hard questions that we really, we really need to work through. Okay? So let's start. Like I said, 15 minutes or so. Right, Let me pull up the questions and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So did you guys learn, you learned a couple of new things? Did you get to know each other a little bit better too? Anybody got a couple of nuggets that really kind of resonated with them at all? I know I ask this out loud all the time, but, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, there's certain things that, man, it just resonates and it's just like, it just clicked. Anybody? Well, well we know why all the Muslims, when they go to the Hajj, get trampled. <laughs> what? Uh huh. Mm hmm. Why is? <laughs> what? Because it's performance based. Because it's performance based. Gotcha. Okay. You have to do it just right, or it doesn't count. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> Oh, gotcha. So it's a performance-based perspective. If they stop to help someone that fell, then they ruin their whole performance-based Yeah, I gotcha, I gotcha. Well, well, just to give you a heads up on that, Joey, yesterday, his performance was peak. Peak. If you see the video of him bull riding, Joe doesn't not only preach the gospel, but he preaches the law of PBR. So, <laughs> it's unbelievable. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, it's kidding. Anyways, one more nugget. Anybody? Yes, Patsy. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone more? Anything? Bud? Somebody brought up that uh, when we're going through something, we may not get it once we expect it because the people around us that are praying for us and that are a part of that are waiting their turn to get the last word in and it's also what's going on with us. Mm -hmm. So, what does God do here in, this, in that chunk of scripture? God establishes a promise, right, to Abram in this moment. It might be an awkward custom, right? And the custom back then in that day was when they make a promise, they would say, let's cut a covenant. Let's make a promise. You know, anybody ever pinky swear or spit shake, right? You ever bought a house? I signed my life away, right? That's what he's doing here. He's making a promise. He's cutting a covenant. And what would happen is, is that they would basically make some sacrifices and, and, and they would take these animals and they would cut them in two and he'd, they'd lay them out on either side and they'd basically walk through the middle of them stating, if I don't fulfill this covenant, this is what's going to happen to me. That's what's happening here. And Abram, what does he do? He's really good at doing the work. He cuts the animal, and he waits a long time. And seemingly, he does this in the middle of the mo in, in the morning. 
And you know, what does he have to do? He's got to take this cow, and he, I don't know how big the cow is. It's a three-year-old heifer. Anybody know how big a three-year-old cow is? Big. How much? How many pounds? Really? Wow. I don't know about you, but you got to cut that in half. So you got to kill it. You got to cut it. Then you got to go, oh, wait, no, no, no. You can't just throw it because it's a big cow, right? So then you got to work to push it here. You got to work to push it there, right? Holy cow, that takes a long time, right? (laughs) So all of a sudden you get done with your cow, and now what do you have to do? I got to do that with a ram, and I got to do that with a goat. And then I got to go get some some birds. And I got to lay them all out in this line. And then he gets done with that, right? He did the work stuff. And then he waits. And he waits. And he waits. <laughs> and, and you're basically saying, wow, Lord, what's taking so long? Right? And then he sees, oh, my gosh, there's some birds that are landing on my carcasses. I better shoo those birds away because I got to make sure that this thing goes off without a hitch. And so... You know, Abraham is still looking. He probably checks the sundial, and he's like, oh, man, Lord, where are you? Anybody ever done that before? God, where are you now? Man, I've been waiting a long time. How come God isn't telling me anything? Where are you, God? I did it all. I did the, I did the work. And he waited, and he waited. And it started getting dark. What's going on? It's hard to wait on God, isn't it? It's hard to wait on God, and you know it's true. Man, we can't stand having to wait for God unless you've gotten to the point in your walk with Jesus where you say, man, I love to wait for God because I know it's the best. But in that time, we have in our minds a timetable, don't we all? Don't you? When you start thinking about what God is going to do, you know, I I want you to hear this. I remember um, when, when I planted River, and I remember the worship leader was praying about going to uh, a mission field. And she was like, I think this, this is what I need to do. And I said, you know what? Let me pray about that. Yeah, that's what you need to do. So the Lord was going to take away the leader that was going to play worship. And I remember being like, well, Lord, if, I just, if this is your will and I give this up, you're just going to bring something back right away, right? Mm-hmm. No, I waited two years and played Christian karaoke. But you know what's something that's magical and powerful and amazing? Not magical, just powerful. Is the fact that when we merged to become reunion, Nanette and her family showed up. You know, I remember thinking, have you let me down, Lord? God never let me down. It was in his perfect timing for all things to come together when he had his own divine timetable. And so sometimes he'll let it drag on. And sometimes we get to the point where we're just so exhausted and then God does something and you go, oh, I would have never even considered to do that. And man, your way was better than mine. <laughs> That's because he's God. That's because he's a good father. That's the lesson you need to learn here. And I just think someone here today needs to hear this. God has made promises And you have it in your mind that you're going to meet God in the middle. You think you're going to meet God in the middle. But we think that God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. Am I right? Anybody found that scripture in the word of God? No, that's in second opinions. The book of second opinions, that's where that's found. Not even in the word of God. And so we so often feel like God is leading and we think then I need to start making some great promises, God. You know, you made some promises, so I need to make some promises. And well, that's not your job. Listen, we all have a part to play. Abram had to sacrifice the animals and cut the animals. But the reality is We don't always have to fill everything, do we? Sometimes it's God's doing. 
And so the reality is, is that we might do all of the stuff that we think will validate it, when the reality is our job is to really just obey. And our job is to really just lay our lives before the feet of Jesus and forsake sin. And so we're not going to meet God halfway in certain parameters. And some of you need to get to the point where you transition from being promise makers to promise believers. You hear what I'm saying now? We think that we need to make the promises to validate our Christianity, but the reality is we just start, need to start believing the promises God's given to us in the word of God. Just right there. Start believing those. Stop making promises to validate your Christianity. And so... We just get to have to get to the point where, God, I'm going to believe you that in your time and in your way, you will keep your word to me. Because that's what a good father does, is keeps his promises. And finally, what happens? God shows up, right? <laughs> when, we, when we actually think he should have been there a lot sooner. Oh, Lord, it's getting dark. What's happening now? Fear and terror are starting to break into his heart, and he's starting to feel a sleepy, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. What happens? Falls asleep. Listen to what verse 13 says. It says, God said to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. Well, oh, that's some good stuff. But I will also judge the nations whom they will serve, and after they will come out with my, many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. And then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. And it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Kadamonite and the Hittite and the Dinomite and the Perizzite and the and Rephim and I'm sorry, Irphim and the Amorite and the Termite and the Canaanite and the Gerbukshite and the Jebusite. I want to make sure you guys are awake. All the ites. We ite? They're right. But there's something interesting I want you to notice about this deal and the promise that God makes about this covenant. This covenant is one-sided. You know, that's why I stated so many of us want to be a part of making the deal when the reality is that's God's. That's God's responsibility. And God makes this and but Abram, he tries his very best to be right in the middle of it, doesn't he? Man, we so want to be a part of it. But sometimes you need to understand, if Jesus is your savior, let him do the saving. You hear that? I mean, I want you to hear this. We, we say, man, Jesus, you saved me from my sins, but does his job continue? Every single moment of the day. But sometimes we want to move in our own power, in our own wisdom and authority. Savior means I do it all the time. Let him do it. And so Abram goes into a deep sleep and he wakes up and Phil's barbecue is in front of him. Now you just thought about Bill's barbecue, so take all of the men there later. <laughs> and what God was saying is, this is my promise. This is something I'm doing in your life because I want to. This is a God thing, not a you thing. This is a God thing. And he promises, right? And he's promising, and I'm getting. He's promising you, and you're getting. That's exactly what the gospel is all about. Is it not? God doing and us getting. It's so simple. Let me give you an example. When I was little, my father would ask me, do you know how much I love you? And you know what he would say? And I would go, how much, Dad? Because I was like this little kid with a squeaky voice. And he'd say, I love you this much. And he'd open his arms real wide. 
I remember there's a couple of pictures of me standing on the top of my dad's shoulders, and we're both open as wide as this, right? And I'd say, Dad, do you know how much I love you? And, and he'd go, I don't know how much. And I'd go, this much. And I tried to pull my hands back as far as I could, right? It was that symbolizing meaning of how wide my dad's love was for me and how wide his lo- my love for him was. It was that symbol. But that's exactly what God is saying to us today as a father, a good father. Do you know how much I love you? And you know what he does? He shows us a picture of the cross with his son hanging on it and saying, this is how much. I'd rather die than live without you. It's a powerful message. It's a powerful message because it's a promise that God gives to each and every one of us that says yes to Jesus. And so our good father gives us hope. And Jesus secures that hope. And the spirit confirms that hope. And that great hope that we have in our heavenly father, our good father is proven by him protecting his children, reassuring his children, talking to his children, giving and keeping promises to his children. And ultimately, just doing the job of being a loving father. It is powerful to see what a good father looks like. So the question I want to ask you today is this. How is your faith today in your good father? Maybe like Abraham, you're sitting here looking at life and wondering all about the whys and the whats and the whens. Listen, God is not afraid of your questions. He just wants his children to talk to him. Because at the end of the day, God will respond. God is a loving father. God wants a personal relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he just says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened. And what does he say to us? What does he say to us today? Take my yoke. Why? Because a father wants to take the responsibility of leading his children, of being the one who is guiding and protecting them. Do you want that for your life? Because the Lord wants that more than anything, but he won't make his children do anything. He wants them to come. And so if you will do that, you will see how good your father is in heaven every single day. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord? Oh.